one, two, one, two, yeah, there we go. So last week, I told you that bacteria are motile. So before I do anything else, I will show you some of these different forms of motility. So just to remind you, motility is just a word used in biology predominantly now in physics as well. It just means self-propulsion. Uh, and it's usually a directed motion towards chemicals. So it's a way or towards a chemical that bacterium either likes or dislikes, but it doesn't have to be just chemical. It can be towards temperatures, or it can also be towards oxygen. So there are diff different ways of doing this, and we have been looking, and I'll also be going to talking mostly about flagellated movements. So that's either with several flagella or with one flagellum. But you can also have axial filaments that help the movement. You can have gliding, and you can have twitching motility. There's still some motilities with some bacteria that are difficult to grow or difficult to do genetics, where we don't really know uh, how, they're, how they're motile. So to start off with, I'm just going to entertain you and show you some of the movies. So this one here is E. coli, and the cell body and the cell filaments have been fluorescently labeled by Harberg in, uh, at Harvard and his group. And uh, what you will see is how they move. So you have a filament that pushes the cell, and then one of the filaments fall, falls out, and you can see that the cell uh, turns a little bit. So that's E. coli. There's another flagellated bacterium. This one is called Rhodobacter spheroides. It has just one filament. And this one will stop and start. So you'll see the filament pushing the cell forward, and then you see the guys. This one will stop. There we go. And then after a while, it keeps going. These guys that I'm showing you next have two flagella bundles on either end, and they look quite different. Still motile, but quite, quite different. Also, you can have gliding. This is mixogliding, mixococcus santos gliding on a surface. So you see that these bacteria are not swimming, but they're still motile, they're gliding. One other bacterium, this one is called Pseudomonas arginosa, twitches, so it's going to extend uh, uh, a filament type structure and it's going to pull itself forward. So this uh, video is quite short, so have a little look. There it is, and then it pull, pulls it up. So I'm going to go back to E. coli. I showed you what it does in 3D, but in 2D, that swimming looks slightly different and it's called swarming. So this is now E. coli again with several filaments, but this looks quite different and it's called swarming. So there's quite a, quite a bit of research going into the swarming mobility close to, close to the surface. E. coli is not the only one that people are looking at the surface. There is another one called Vibrio, uh, and this one here is again swarming close to the surface. And, and this here is one bacterium. So what it does somehow when it, when it senses that it's close to the surface, it stops dividing and forms this gigantic one long bacterium that forms a spiral. And you can actually study how it goes into the spiral and how it comes out of the spiral. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, different types of uh, motility, but I'm going to swing back to E. coli now. This is the one that we have been looking at the hands-on session. So this is an illustration of how the propulsion works. So you have a cell body. This is roughly one to three microns long, and then you have about six, and we say about six because if you look at different literature sources, you'll find three, you'll find eight, you'll find six, and each bacterium has a slightly different number, but Let's go for six, because it's nice and round. Half a dozen of these filaments spaced around the cell body randomly, and they form a bundle at the back. So this bundle then rotates and propels the cell forward. This is what generates the, uh, the motion. At the end of each of these filaments, there is a motor structure called bacterial flag flagella motor. And this is a very impressive uh, motor structure. It's about 50 nanometers in size, and it spans the whole of the cell envelope. So in the case of E. coli, cell envelope consists of two lipid bilayers. So they're called outer membrane and inner membrane. And there's also a structure called cell wall. And this structure is a stress stiffening type of material. So it's a stiffer material, and the more the cell gets pressurized, the, the stiffer it gets. So the motor spans all across. It's 50 nanometers in size, and it does have a rotor, and it does have a stator part of the motor. So the rotor part, it's right here, and this will rotate, pushed by stator units. So stator units use something called protomotive force, although it's not actually a force. It's an electrochemical potential. So the cell is charged inside, outside. Inside is more negative. And then when the ions 
protons are passing through these stator units, they're giving energy to generate the movement to push, to push the rotor. So this rotor, then it's coupled to a structure called hook which is around 50 nanometers, and it's quite sharply controlled. The size is quite sharply controlled. It is really 50 nanometers. And this one is a universal joint. It's very flexible, which is why it allows it to bend all of those filaments that are in the middle of the cell. And then they connect to the filament, which can be 3 to 10 microns long, and this is a little bit of a stiffer, stiffer structure. So what is quite important is that a motor in E. coli can rotate both ways. It can go clockwise and counterclockwise. Clockwise. Most of the time, it spends rotating counterclockwise. So the cell swims forward because the filament is formed. Every so often, every 10 to 20 seconds, for about 0.1 second, the motor goes the other way, one or two. And when that happens, you can imagine you have this filament rotating one way, and a few motors start going the other way, and they disrupt the bundle. And the bundle falls apart, and then the cell is doing Brownian movement. So during that period, there is a good likelihood that when all of the motors go back into the same direction, the cell is going to be going in a different direction. So it does that normally. It just does a Brownian, uh, a Brownian walk. So it goes for 10 to 20 seconds, roughly straight, and then a 0.1 uh, second of wobbling about, and then continues 10 to 20 seconds. When it wants to, uh, when it wants to navigate, it employs something called chemotactic network. And I'll take you through it, but you can think about this network as just a series of feedback circuits that transmit the signal from the outside uh, uh, to the motor itself. The motor is the output of the network. The input here is a chemical. I am presenting it as a square, because all you need to know about this chemical right now is that E. coli either likes it or dislikes it. So when that chemical is present, it binds to the uh, gray proteins. These are the receptors. And then these gray proteins send the signal down the network. There's few of these proteins that you see colored, and they really are just feedback. They're just controlling one another. The only one that I'd like you to remember is the green protein. This one is called key Y. When it gets phosphorylated, right at the end of the network output, this green key Y in a phosphorylated form sits down onto the motor, and that binding changes the direction of the motor. So when you have a signal from outside, what will you do to direct the movement of the bacterium? You will change the frequency with which the bundle is disrupted, i.e. the motor goes the other way. Right? So if you like something, you're swimming 10 to 20 seconds straight, and you don't really want to have that wobble so that you go away from what you like, and then you will suppress the wobble. You will change the rotation of the motor less frequently. If you dislike something, you will increase the frequency of these wobbles so that you have a higher likelihood of turning and going the other way. Right? However, to efficiently move along the gradient of things that you like or away from a gradient of things that you don't like, you need to be able to do one more thing. And this is in chemotaxis called perfect adaptation. It just means that you reset the network base uh, back to its original steady state, where by steady state I mean you swim for about 10 to 20 seconds and then you occasionally wobble and you swim 10 to 20 seconds. When you encounter something you don't, you like or dislike, you change the frequency of these wobbles, but very soon you need to go back. And this is illustrated in, in this experiment. So on the y-axis, I'm showing you uh, the bias, the amount of time cell goes straight. And on the x-axis is the time in seconds. So around five seconds, you see that the cell encounters a pulse of something that it likes. What it does, it starts swimming straight for longer, so it suppresses these stumbles. But very quickly, within a few seconds, about five seconds, it resets back to the same value. So now, when it encounters something else, it can still sense it. Okay? So that's one important characteristic of the information processing of this uh, network. The other one is that it's very sensitive. So what I'm showing you here is the bias. This time, the bias, how, what is the frequency? These are previous experiments, so I have not chosen to switch the bias now. So on this axis is the probability of tumbling rather than, than swimming straight. So how many times does the motor switch? And here is the concentration of the green guy, key Y in a phosphorylated form, which is responsible for generating. This is the protein responsible for generating the switches of the motor. And what you can see that the response, the bias, changes very, very sharply. So the so hill function there with a few micromolar concentration difference. So it responds really finely to micromolar concentrations. It's a very sensitive, uh, sensitive network. What I'll also tell you 
is that E. coli is pressurized. So there is about a bike tire of pressure inside the cell. And there's quite a bit of research of understanding what exactly does that pressure uh, uh, do? How does, it, how does the cell use the, this force against its surface area uh, in order to grow and, and, and survive? So inside, again, just to remind you, it is separated from the outside by a sem semipermeable membrane. In the case of E. coli, these are two lipid bilayers one on the inside, the other one on the outside, and then in the middle is this cell wall, which is a, a stiffer material. Inside, there is a higher concentration compared to the outside, normally, and this generates osmotic pressure, so the cell is pressurized about a bike tire of pressure. When the concentration outside changes, say that, for example, it increases, what happens, and it needs to, before I go on, it needs to actively maintain that pressure, obviously, because it has a semi-permeable membrane. Okay? When the external concentration changes, say that, for example, it increases, first thing that happens is just physics. So what wants to happen is that the inside and outside equilibrate, and that is what happens. So the cell shrinks, and it can shrink up to 50%, and then the inside concentration and outside concentration are the same. The other way around, when the external concentration decreases, the water rushes in, and the purpose is the same, to equilibrate the inside and the outside, and then the cell expands and risks potentially bursting. So in both of these scenarios, you lost 50% of your volume, you shrunk, or you're about to burst, you expand it, E. coli doesn't appreciate it very much. So it does have mechanisms uh, to cope. So in the case of this shrinking, so now it's shrunk, and in order to recover pressure and recover volume, what it starts doing, it employs these pumps, and these pumps pump stuff in, and I'm really going to stay at stuff here. They are ions, they're some organic osmolites, but it really matters that there are molecules that go in. As they go in, the water goes in, because it's equilibrating. And at some point, it starts pushing against the cell wall. And at that point, the volume no longer expands by the same amount of the stuff that comes in, and you start repressurizing the cell. The other way around, now the cell has expanded because we decreased the external concentration and it's about to burst. What it has are these mechanosensitive channels. These are like iris-like structures that open up a hole for the solutes as well. So now the membrane is semi-permeable not just to water, but also to all the other solutes. And these solutes are going to come out, and then the water is going to come out, and the cell, cell volume recovers. So what we, the reason I'm telling you this is because these shape changes... Uh, can happen when the E. coli is swimming as well. But before I pose that question, I'll show you how some of these shrinking behavior looks like. So top one, we have increased the external concentration by adding some sucrose. In red, we're marking the cell wall. We're marking that stiffer material. In green, we're marking the inside of the cell, just the inner compartment. So because we have two lipid bilayers, we effectively have two compartments, the inside compartment and then this around ring compartment and the outside. So what happens when you increase this concentration, you see that the cell shrinks. And you can even see detachment on, 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 on the sides. If we increase it with something really big, like dextrin, that cannot pass through this outer membrane, the whole thing shrinks, and it shrinks quite a bit. So you can see that the material, the red material, the, uh, the stiffer material, is actually not that stiff when it's not pressurized. It does exhibit stress stiffening, so it gets stiffer when the cell is more pressurized. When we increase it with sodium chloride, you see that the peeling off happens straight away, and then you lost about 40% of the water, and the cell wall actually stays uh, uh, unchanged. And this is real, real time. So it is really, really fast. This fast initial response is really fast. It's just, it's just uh, equilibrating inside and the outside. So what we wanted to ask is, what happens when you do the two together. So you're swimming, but you're also experiencing these osmotic changes. And this is something that will be happening in the gut, and I'll motivate it a little bit more uh, uh, in a second. But there is previous literature that suggests that something interesting does happen. So if I show you this plate, so what is happening in this plate is that you have a plug of stiffer agar with a high concentration of something. On the top one, that high concentration is of something that E. coli does not care about. It's, it's in this case, it, it's ribitol, but it can be sucrose. E. coli doesn't care about sucrose. It's not like us. It likes glucose, but it doesn't like sucrose. So at the bottom is a high concentration of something that it does like. The rest of this plate is agar of a smaller concentration, so E. coli can swim through it. Here, in this heavier, concentration, higher concentration of agar plug, it cannot. So this plug creates a gradient of high osmolarity downwards. 
And what you can see, this black ring around it, where E. coli does not reach. So there is a negative form of taxis. It swims away from this very high concentration, even when this high concentration is of something that it likes. Because at smaller concentration of something that it likes, you'll see accumulation of, of, of cells. So there is previous indi indication that these high osmolarities, even for molecules that it does not care about, in terms of uh, 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 they're neither their attractants, like not, neither food or not, uh, not something toxic, it will still exhibit a form of taxis. There's a little bit more evidence that this signal could travel, this high osmotic signal could travel down the network in this experiment. So what I'm showing you here is this receptor molecule, the molecule that normally sends these chemicals that E. coli either likes or dislikes. And what in this experiment has been done is that there was a fluorescently labeled fluorescent protein put in the place where normally the chemical that E. coli likes or dislikes would sit. Right? And then what you look at, you look at the amount of polarization and the difference between two polarizations. So you have parallel and perpendicular, the difference, and then you, then, then you normalize it. So when there is a lot of wobble, this number is going to be higher. When there is less wobble, it's going to be, it's going to be smaller. And what happens in the experiment is, if you look at the red one here, R on the y-axis is this number. It's essentially the amount of wobble in this protein. And on x-axis, it is 9. So what you see that when you add that sodium chloride, sucrose, or dextran, those that I showed you, there is quite a bit of shrinking in the cell, there is less wobble. So the, the, when the membrane shrinks, it could mimic the binding of some kind of chemical. On top here, you have just a fluorescent protein that is present in the cytoplasm. It's not on the side of the cell, and there is no difference. There is no difference in the signal. I should also say that these guys here in Howard Berg's lab have looked at whether the signal could possibly travel down the network, and they found that there is indication that it could, but I'm not going to go into details uh, uh, of that just now because the experiment is slightly more complicated. Okay, so. There is an indication that a osmotic change, change in osmotic pressure of the cell, could go and travel down the network. But I also want to motivate to you why would this, why would this be interesting. So normally the chemotactic network, the sensitive of chemicals, things that a bacteria like or dislike, is done in a very, very uh, limited environment. So there is not much else. There's just a buffered solution with micromolar concentration of things that bacteria like or dislike. But this is an indication of what might happen in your gut. So after a steak meal, what they have measured here is the osmolarity in your stomach and your small intestine. And what you can see that it goes to about 200, 300 uh, uh, osmol. This osmol is the amount of, like for example, something that is 150 millimolar concentration will be around 300 uh, osmol. So it's the measure of the, the, the amount of chemicals present. And the osmolarity can be increased even with things that E. coli does not like to eat or it's not afraid of. So this is, could be just very passive molecules, yet the osmolarity is higher. Same thing happens after a bit more sugary meals. So there, here's a donut a milk uh, meal. And again, on y-axis is the osmolarity, and on x-axis is your intestine, essentially. So we're traveling from stomach uh, to small intestine, and here's slightly different. You go from quite high osmolarity, and then you drop. It still stays relatively high as you travel down the intestine. So these kind of shocks, these kind of changes in osmolarity, E. coli could encounter while it's swimming uh, through our uh, uh, gut and potentially trying to, trying to infect. Uh, so we wanted to know what happens when you have the two together. How does the network actually respond when it experiences a, an increase in the osmolarity? And here's how the experiment looks like. So what we do, we attach the cell onto the cover slip surface. So the cell is now uh, stationary. We cut the filament, and then onto the filament, we attach a plastic bead, a polystyrene bead, index of refraction around 1.45. And that bead can be of different sizes. In this particular experiment, we use 0.5 micron bead. But because that's a little bit small to see, what I'm going to show you how the experiment looks like, we we attach a 1 micron bead. So this is a real-life experiment. You'll see when I, uh, when I play it, you'll see bacteria on the surface. I'll be going in and out of Z, so you'll see some of them on the surface. And then you'll see a bunch of beads. And what we're doing there, we're looking for a good spinner. We're looking for something that rotates quite well, and then we place it in an optical trap. And I'll take you through why in a second. So here's how the experiment looks like. So you see some of these rotation, and you see the cells on the surface. 
So now you're passing through the slide and it really is a single motor experiment. You're looking for one individual motor that you will do the experiment on. And the ones that are rotating quite a bit are probably the ones that we're not going to record. We record those that you can hardly see. Your eyes get used to the little wobble that could be a good spinner because we want the filament to be as short as possible so that the drag on the motor comes mostly, mostly from the bead. So we want really, really short filaments. Okay, so then we put the, once we found a good spinner, we put it into a heavily attenuated optical trap. And this is how the system looks like. So this part here is just a bright field illumination that gets sent to the condenser and the objective. And then down here, we have a set of cameras. We have an EMCCD, uh, uh, SCMOS. We don't have an eyepiece. We just uh, have a, what we call a crappy camera. It's just a CCD, standard CCD, that gets onto a monitor. And this part here is for fluorescence that we're not going to use in this experiment. But what form, uh, forms the trap is this laser here, 855 nanometer laser, that is just expanded so that it overfills the back aperture of the objective and is then sharply focused and forms an optical trap. It's sent after the condenser, so the back focal plane of the condenser is imaged on the position-sensitive detector or a quadrant photodiode. The reason for that is that in the back focal plane of the condenser, you have a Fourier transform of the image. So if you image that onto a position-sensitive detector, you're sensing interference patterns of what's happening in the, in the image plane. This is how the microscope looks like real life. So here's the condenser and, 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 and objective. Uh, this part here is where the, where the uh, position sensitive detector sits. And here is our laser. And to show you that we really just have one telescope, I'm zooming in here. Here's the laser. Here are the two lenses that expand the beam and then send it onto the objective. And right there is our position sensitive detector. Right. So, the way you can think about it, so once we put our bead into this optical trap that is heavily attenuated, it's not trapping, it's just really sensing the rotation of the bead, the experiment looks a little bit like this. So the signal that we're going to be detecting, here is our flagella motor, here is a very short filament, we're going to attach a bead. In this particular cartoon, the bead is a lot smaller than our, our bead, is a lot bigger compared to the cell. The bubbles are ions, our test impression of ions. Uh, so the, the bead rotates. And then you put that, you image this the back focal plane, the Fourier transform of this rotation and the laser onto the quadrant diode, and you can think about it as sensing different amounts of light falling on the, uh, on the diode like so, although that's not exactly correct. It is an interference pattern. It's not about shades. Uh, and then you get a signal. You get a, a, a speed of the motor one way and speed of the motor uh, the other way. Right, so here's a signal that you display real life. You convert that into the speed, and you get speed one way, speed the other way. And now we're interesting to know how the motor is going to respond in terms of changing the frequency of rotation, which sets the direction of movement. We need the amount of time spent rotating one way over the amount of time spent uh, rotating the other way. And that's what we call bias. So it's the amount of time spent going the other way where the tumble occurs over the, amount, the total amount of time. And the experiment itself, when Nierko does the experiment, this is what you see. So here's the speed of one individual motor, and here's time in minutes. And this is a representative trace. So you see that the speed before any kind of stimuli is around 80 hertz. And you see that occasionally the motor goes the other way. So about 10 seconds, swim roughly straight, and then occasionally for 0.1 second, go the other way. This blue line is where quite high, in this case, osmotic shock, a step function comes in. What you can see is that the motor stops spinning and then increases the speed. And in this period, there is no changing of motor rotation. And then it ends up, there's this lots of switching happening. It ends up at a steady state. These are minutes. So it's for quite a long time where it just wobbles a lot more. And it does not recover back to the initial level. This is also in this histogram. So this is now the histogram of bias, the amount of time spent this way over the total amount of time. And you can see that after the shock, which is here, the minutes are the same, you see a lot more switching events. And the map here, the color map, is just condensed histogram. It's just 1D histogram. Because what I want to show you, I want to show you quite a lot of uh, uh, D cells. i come back to this in a second. So these are now these 1D maps uh, of biases for a lot of cells. Each line is one cell. Here is a shock of 100 millimolar then 200 millimolar and 400, they're getting higher and higher. What you can see that before the shock, which is a um, yellow line, 
on x-axis is your time in minutes, that before the shock, the bias is relatively low, so it goes straight most of the time, then it switches a little bit. And then after the shock, you see a period increasing in length with the magnitude of the shock, where there is no switching of the direction. And then there is a steady state increase in the amount of time that the cell switches. So it does not go, it doesn't adapt, it does not go back. What I want to show you is also uh, this one here, where we comparing this response of the cell without, yes, that's a little bit what it does, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll call Mark after to demonstrate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll discuss what it might, what. so actually, in this period of time, it's 10 to 20 minutes uh, where the volume does recover. So we keep it in a buffer where we allow it to, to, to recover, recover the volume. So here is the cell that I showed you. This is the wild type cell. That just means it's, it's, we, we haven't genetically touched it. Uh, and this one here is we deleted that green guy, the one that sits on the motor, just that protein. So we call it delta key Y, without that protein. And when you see without that protein, here's the speed of the motor on Y axis and the time on X axis in minutes again, is that you have the speed response pretty much the same. You're just lacking, you're just lacking these switching events. That does not necessarily mean that the network is involved in generating this behavior. It just means that the key Y protein binding is responsible for it. And I'll touch upon that in a second. Okay, so here are the speed changes. So I'm again plotting the same number of cells. This is one shock magnitude higher and higher. Uh, on the uh, Y axis is the speed in Hertz. Here's the color, uh, uh, color uh, scale. And then on the X axis you have time again, same time periods, exact same cells. So you can see that after the relatively high shocks, there is a bit of an increase in the speed, but also for very high shocks, there's a drop in speed and then an increase, increase in the speed. Right, so we have two things that we have not normally seen in a chemotactic network. This is that the bias increases and it does not go back to the same value. So there is no perfect adaptation. It's a steady state increase in bias. And also the speed can change. So there are two types of questions that we can ask. Number one is how is this actually happen on a molecular level within the cell? So we left that aside for now. And the other question is, can this generate taxes? Can with this type of behavior, can we explain what we see? And that was, if you remember, that swimming away from a plug of high concentration. And here I'm presenting it here. So if this is a high osmolarity, there will be less and less cells as you, uh, as you go out. So to answer this question, whether this type of behavior can generate taxes, I'm splitting the, 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 the way the response is generated in two possible ways. So number one is that there is no information processing. Okay? So as soon as you step into the higher uh, osmolarity environment, your bias and your speed can change at that position. And that could happen even without any kind of sensing because, for example, at higher osmolarity, there is more stuff inside. So the pressure inside is actually higher, which could make binding to the motor and switching easier. It could just change the binding constants and therefore, as you step, you actually straight away change the bias and change the motor speed. So then the question here is, can the change in the diffusion constant give you a tactic, negative tactic type of behavior? So to answer that question, we need to think about what is the diffusion constant on a microscopic level, right? So if you remember when you're going from a Brownian Walker into a continuous limit where your step size is getting smaller and the time period between your random steps is getting smaller as well, that you find a solution only if the ratio of the two is a constant. Then you have this macroscopic diffusion, diffusion constant. So to answer the question of whether or not a spatially dependent diffusion constant uh, will give you taxes, you need to think a little bit about these microscopic steps and, and, and time periods in between. So if your speed, it could change in, in space, but it does stay, the, the ratio of the two stays the same, then your equilibrium concentration will not change. But if you're either keeping the step constant or you're, or you're keeping the time constant or you're changing all of them, you will get negative taxes. Also, if you're changing all of them, you can no longer as easily find the diffusion constant. You need to be a little bit more careful here. You can write, you can write the uh, diffusion equation, but the diffusion constant will not be as easily defined. That is if you are only changing your, uh, you're changing your bias and your speed in, in space without any information processing. 
the other scenario that the network is involved and there is information processing. So now it goes, the signal travels down, down the network. There you need to be a little bit more careful. So now the, the most basic question is, can you get a negative type of taxes uh, in, in the scenario where your Brownian walker now, it really depends on where it came from, right? Because it's going to be sensing a signal across a certain time period. So I, uh, it, it matters where I came from because I was sensing for a given period of time before I came to this spot. So it's, no, it's now becoming an anomalous diffusion. It's no longer a, 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 a straightforward diffusion. So in that case, because of this dependency, on where you came from, you will get negative taxes if you exhibit no adaptation. Right? What happens with the speed, with the speed changes on top of that, that, that that's where it gets more, more complicated. So we're thinking that what we observe, this increase in a steady state bias, so no adaptation, and a change of speed in both of these scenarios can give negative taxes exactly how the swimming behavior will look like and how will they now behave where there's high osmolarity gradient or a chemical that they like or dislike at the same time as high osmolarity gradient, which is most likely the gut scenario, that's the next, the, uh, uh, the next thing to do. So I will leave with the conclusions. So unlike the chemotaxis, osmotaxis exhibit an elevated steady state bias. So there is no perfect adaptation. You never adapt, you stay at a higher bias. Uh, Osmo a response can include the final change in motor speed, and that really depends on how sharp the gradient is as you are uh, swimming through it. Uh, so a transient response to a very sharp gradient can involve more complicated things like a drop of speed and then in, uh, uh, recovery of the speed with no switching events. And this osmotic response can lead to negative type of taxes in an osmotic gradient, like they have observed in a plate. But obviously, the, 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 it can be more complicated depending on exactly how the gradient, how the gradient looks like. And here's where we are. Uh, of the people in the group, these are the students and the, the, the uh, postdocs. So the one that has done the work that I've talked to you about, you met. This is Yerko. Uh, and this is how they all look like. Uh, and I will stop here to leave time for questions.